Hey, JRFE students. Uh, today we're going to talk about suburbanization, which is uh, tied in with our urbanization unit. Um, and basically, suburbanization is classified as um, the uh, population settlements that surround a large city uh, or urban settlement. And this is, uh, this is an area where it's typically classified as uh, mostly residential housing, um, as well as shops and businesses and other types of uh, maybe factories and things like that are included in these suburbs uh, that are not, uh, you know, for various reasons, that are not feasible in a large uh, urban environment. And so we're going to take a look at why these suburbs evolve and why the U.S. is so much more likely to have suburbs than in other countries. All right, so first off, I'd like to take a, a quick look at this short video to give you an idea of, uh, of not only what a suburb looks like, but also the, uh, the general um, you know, feelings behind uh, you know, suburbs and, and what they're like in America. So this is the opening to uh, you know, a, a television show that gives you an idea of, um, of what that looks like. So let's take a look. Oh, of course, never mind. <laughs> All right, uh, well, let me just describe it for you. Um, basically, as you can kind of tell here from the picture, it has um, these people that all look the same. Uh, and in the background, you can see these houses. They all are generally, you know, exactly the same. Everybody drives the same car, goes to the same place, leaves work at the same time. They're driving to, you know, to work and dropping off kids at school. Uh, and everything's made to look just exactly alike. Um, and suburbs, uh, in many ways, do still, um, you know, look that way. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, there's a, a myriad of different reasons as to why. All right, but let's take a look at some of the problems and, and issues with suburbs. Um, so, why did suburbs originally um, become so popular in America? Um, <clears throat> well, first and foremost, it's mainly because uh, mostly after people uh, were living in urban centers after industrialization in America, they recognized that, uh, you know, Urban areas are not the best place to, to raise kids. It's expensive. Um, you can't get much in terms of housing with many bedrooms or space available. Uh, and so they realized that if they owned an automobile, and so when automobiles became much more, uh, you know, affordable um, in, uh, you know, the 1950s and thereafter, people were able to move outwards and then commute uh, or basically drive to work from the suburbs after that. All right, other uh, factors that uh, you know, push people out of the city centers into uh, the suburbs was because of segregation. All right, so segregation, as you may recall from you know, history class, is where uh, whites and blacks in America were separated, and uh, that included housing and where people settled. Um, as more and more minorities moved into city centers looking for work, um, and uh, and things of that nature and housing, it caused uh, you know issues with the white residents in the cities, and led to many white residents moving out of the city centers and into suburbs as a result to move away uh, from uh, you know the minorities that moved in. Uh, There's a couple different ways in which this happened, um, but it did affect um, housing patterns. One is called redlining, which basically is where the bank uh, refuses to give a loan uh, to certain people based on demographics, such as minority status. So uh, like, for instance, if you want to buy a house in a certain area of the city, um, you know, they would uh, not, the bank would not give you the loan for that area, but they would give you a loan for the same price uh, in other areas uh, of the city if you are a minority. Uh, this led to a process called redlining. You can kind of see that here. It's basically a red line on the map saying they're not allowed uh, to get a loan for you know, a, you know, a house in that area if they're a minority. And this caused a lot of segregation along in, in cities. And those still exist today. Um, just take a look at a population demo, you know, demographic map of Charlotte uh, today to see a very clear racial divide on where people live. Uh, and in large part, it was because of these redlining practices. Um, additionally, um, Many real estate agents and, uh, and developers uh, realized very quickly this uh, white flight that would occur when a minority, like a, you know, an African-American, Hispanic, or any uh, you know, non-white would move into a neighborhood. Uh, you know, they would, uh, in large numbers, move out of that neighborhood. Um, you know, for, for various different reasons, but basically um, <clears throat> this was quite common and that housing prices would go down. 
um, as a result. And so people realize whether it was because of you know, racism or um, just simply out of fear that their house um, would not be valued as much anymore, they would move out of the neighborhood once a minority moved in. We call they, or excuse me, not we they they called this white flight um, that you know move whites out of certain neighborhoods after minorities moved in. Um, now the term blockbusting comes from the fact that many real estate agents and developers would encourage. Um, you know, minorities to move into typically all white neighborhoods in order to make more money. And the reason is this, if they can get one, uh, uh, you know, resident, um, you know, or, you know, a, a minority to move into, you know, family to move into a neighborhood, this would cause everybody else to panic, move and want to move out. And they make a commission off of every home sold. Additionally, they're going to then after that home is sold, be able to sell that again to a minority uh, at a lower price and therefore driving up the, their per, you know, particular like home prices. So basically the, the real estate agents and developers were um, stoking this uh, you know, white flight phenomenon. Um, but anyway, th this caused a lot of problems. Uh, but one of the outcomes was that people, a lot of uh, white residents moved out of the city centers once the minorities uh, in the different areas moved in and they moved out to the suburbs. All right, so this is the, uh, the white flight. So let me make sure that everybody understands that, you know, what generally happened. White middle class families would move away out of the city centers and more to the, uh, uh, the outer rings of you know, settlement, which includes the suburbs. But then minorities would move into the, uh, you know, the, the, the suburbs as well. And this caused them to move you know, further out to you know, further suburbs. And additionally, <clears throat> uh, you know, the, the issues and, and other surrounding plans uh, you know, made it difficult to continue this trend. And ultimately, uh, you know, we see you know, segregation in cities and in the outer reaches are still um, you know, continuing today. All right, so why did people move to suburbs? Well, the push factors were the negative perception of the core of the city, as in like it's polluted in the city. Um, you know, there's uh, you know, not enough space. Uh, the housing cost is very high in the city, right? Because, you know, there's land is scarce in a city center. Um, but out in the suburbs, there's lots of land. Uh, and so therefore you can afford more. It's lower in price and you can build a bigger house and have a yard to raise a family in. Uh, and also the, the segregation factors, right? The, the racist factors as well that push people out of the city centers was a contributing factor as well. Uh, but in these suburbs, they had more modern housing. They were going to be new housing. Uh, <clears throat> you know, don't have to worry about is pollution as much and uh, smog from the city and it's cleaner. It's typically like the crime rates are lower in suburbs. And so it led to a lot more people moving outwards. But like what led to people... Um, you know, really, uh, you know, able to do, uh, you know, suburbanization, All right? So let's give you an example here. Columbia is our city center. You can see a clear belt line, as what they call it, right, of, uh, of basically the interstates that surround it in kind of a circular pattern of I-20, I-77, 26 combined. Um, and, uh, you know, living outside of those, that circle is are what we call suburbs, right? So the inner area of the circle is the city of Columbia. Um, and, uh, and so we have some inner suburbs as well, such as, uh, you know, you got West Columbia and Casey are, you know, considered inner suburbs. And then we have outer suburbs like, uh, Blythewood and Elgin and Camden and you got Chapin, Gilbert, um, places that are easy to, you know, relatively easy to access, um, downtown Columbia. You could live in these places and travel easily to downtown Columbia for all the major things like jobs, uh, you know. Uh, any type of shops and other type of businesses that are located downtown. Um, but in these outer areas, there's more housing, um, you know, uh, land is cheaper. People can afford a larger house, especially if they have a family. Uh, and so we see families tend to live more in suburbs like that. All right. So uh, we call this model the peripheral model. And this is one that's pretty unique to America. Most European cities does, uh, do not have this model, but in the U.S. it's very common. The peripheral model means that there's a central city like Columbia and many surrounding areas um, where you have suburban population centers where people live, you know, these residences. Um, 
and typically the middle class um, and wealthy um, oftentimes live in the suburbs, whereas you have uh, you know a mix of wealthy but also very poor live in the uh, the inner city uh, for various reasons, like uh, we, we learned about with uh, you know government housing and you know the projects and things like that being located in the cities, as well as uh, being relatively close to uh, work centers as well. So if you don't have you can't afford transportation, it's more conducive to live in these. Uh, you know, government housing closer to the city, you can take advantage of public transportation and things like that. So you have, you know, middle, uh, you know, uh, middle class to upper middle class typically live in the suburbs, whereas the wealthy live uh, in a mix of the, uh, the inner city and, and, uh, and suburbs too. All right, but it should be noted that in most other parts of the world, including Europe, Latin America, and Africa and Asian cities, um, only the wealthy elite live in the city center. Uh, and the poor have to live in the outskirts, right? You don't see the, the suburbs popping up there as much, um, mainly because of the, the lack of the uh, the importance of automobiles, the lack of segregation factors that we talked about before not existing there. Um, and, you know, you can hold on to that wealth. You know, if you own that land, that property in the inner city, you can hold on to that uh, and pass that down to generational, you know, as far as generational wealth to your kids and therefore, uh, you know, increase your family's um, overall wealth. All right, so why did we suburbanize in the U.S.? Uh, <clears throat> big part of it was post-World War II. So we had a baby boom, as many of you already know. But we had a large number of, uh, you, know, um, you know, the baby boom generation births, uh, people coming home from war in World War II and then starting to settle down and have families. Uh, they had a large family. They had, uh, you know, solid jobs uh, to come back home to in factories. The economy is doing really well. And also, if you were in the military, you have the GI Bill that paid for your education. You could go to school. Many people got um, you know, degrees after, after they uh, came home uh, from World War II. And after they did this and settled down and started families, they realized that you know they, they wanted to move further out of the city for all those reasons we talked about before. Um, one of the first suburban um, housing communities to pop up was called a Levittown. Uh, these were like what you think of as like a cookie cutter home, a factory produced home, like they could make them super quick and efficient. They weren't the best, um, but they were modern. Um, they, uh, they were very cheap to make for the, you know, the, the building company um, and they can make a ton of them. Um, and this allowed for people to move out of the cities um, into the suburbs. But they still needed one other factor, and that is cars, right? Interstates, they made roads, public transportation um, made it possible for people to move out of the city center because you didn't have to walk. Now to work, you could drive a car. Uh, and so we have better roads and transportation systems that allow people to move further out of the city, drive from these Levitt towns um, into the city center for work. All right, so this is kind of what it looks like here. All right, this is a Levitt town, or one of the original ones. And if anybody lives in some of these communities here uh, in, in Blythewood, uh, you, you might think this looks somewhat familiar, right? You got all the houses look generally the same um, and they all kind of go in a row. They're kept together. They have these winding streets um, that everybody kind of looks uh, like, like this. all the houses look the same. Um, and you can produce a lot of them uh, and you got a large number of people that can live in these areas. But they all have you know their own single unit family uh, that lives there. They have yards and more space. Um, so there's benefits to it as well, right? But that's the general trend. 